So we can't possibly cover everything we did last week uh, in depth, but I do want to summarize it like this. Uh, the letter of 1 John, which is what we're going to be moving through for the duration of the fall all the way into, uh, into Advent, uh, is a letter born of, written from, and for the community shaped by the Gospel of John as unique from other communities and other Gospels. And we said this matters because we have misunderstood the Gospel of John, and because of that misunderstood Christianity as Greek, dualistic, and literal. Um, this is the lens through which we usually read the Gospel of John, when in fact, what we've learned recently is that the Gospel of John is Jewish, non-dual, uh, and mystical, um, very metaphorical, parabolic language. Beyond that, if you want more of the background, I do highly encourage you to check out um, the introduction from last week. We wrapped up with this observation uh, that whatever the writers of the letter of 1 John are getting on about, it is an experience. Um, it's not an idea. Um, it's not abstract. For them, it's a lived reality, and they use that language. We've seen, we've heard, we've touched. Uh, and we said what they have experienced is life, which again, this sort of remains very abstract. But I made the comment that Jesus was, in their understanding, Jesus was the one who revealed this life. Um, the content of the message isn't Jesus, but rather that Jesus is the one who reveals the content of the message, which is life. And we sort of use the example, if, there's, if the moment of revelation is the pulling back of a curtain, the thing behind the curtain isn't Jesus. In the Gospel of John, it's life. Jesus is the one who is pulling back the curtain, which is actually a very different understanding of Christianity than most of modern Western Christianity. So, one of the reasons this is incredibly important is because both the Gospel of John and the writers of the letter come from this mystical conviction that whatever Jesus is doing, whatever he's demonstrating, sharing, showing, however it is that Jesus achieves oneness with God, union with the divine, uh, the pinnacle of God consciousness in humanity, Jesus doesn't create it. <laughs> Jesus is merely pointing to it. So as, port as important as this figure is, Jesus is actually revealing what has always been, which is why both in the Gospel of John and in this letter, it starts with, from the beginning. This isn't something that is new with Jesus, like it just came on the scene. And so it's something also that we already have. He's revealing what always has been, what is, what always will be, uh, and it's a kind of life sort of a depth and density of, of experience. We could say it like this, he doesn't drill the well, nor is Jesus the water. But he's the one who moves a stone and says, hey, there's a well there, are you thirsty? Um, and those are two very different things. So uh, for how many of you, that's a different understanding of Jesus maybe than you've heard or that you grew up with? Like that the, the center, the content of the message isn't Jesus, it's actually life? Okay. Um, so uh, if that's intriguing or terrifying or exciting, um, we're actually going to be starting, hopefully in the next few weeks, uh, Jim Kane is going to be leading a group, just an eight-week limited run group called Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time. Um, and some things like this will be coming up, uh, sort of alternative ways of understanding this figure uh, than probably what we've been raised with. So the opening lines of the letter of 1 John could be paraphrased like this. We want you to know that we've experienced the kind of life that Jesus said was possible. All right, and then they go on. Uh, this life was revealed to us. We have seen it and testify to it. We proclaim to you the eternal life. All right, and that's where we're going to spend our time tonight. Um, aeon zoe is, is the Greek word. So zoe is life. Uh, aeon is most of the time a modifier which is attached to it. Now, what are our conceptions of what is meant by eternal life? And these can be your own convictions or these can be things that you think are prevalent in culture. What do people think of when they hear eternal life? Heaven, after you die. Somebody say hell. <laughs> uh, immortality, right? Highlander, absolutely. Forever, yes, forever. Anything else? Eternal life. Salvation, ouch. All right. Um, yes, that. Uh, so we have inherited uh, over time, culturally, and probably many of us personally, an understanding of the word eternal, eternal life, that is related to time. And so we end up with this assumption, even if we're not actively thinking about it, that whatever this is, after we die, it must be, um, that whatever this thing is, it will s sort of exist in this successive unfolding sequence of seconds and minutes and hours and time and days without end. Um, 
But this is in no way consistent with the way that Jesus or John or the community of John think about eternal life. And so we'll come back to the word eternal, but I want to start with life because we don't actually get the distinction in the English translation, but there are different words for the word life in the Greek, and John does make these distinctions. So for example, this is from the Gospel of John, the one who loves their life will lose it, while the one who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Life, life, life. We've got life three times. Not super helpful. Um, what this actually says, though, in, in Greek is suke, suke, zoe. Um, so suke, or we would, we would sort of think of this in the English translation as psyche, uh, is one word for a specific kind of life we'll talk a little more about. But essentially it says if, if you love your psyche, you'll lose it. But if you hate your psyche, then you can gain zoe. So life, life, life in English, but they're actually totally different in the Greek. Two totally different kinds of life. And it's important that we make that distinction. There is something about, it sounds like from what's being said, there's something about the way that we relate to the psyche life, whatever that is, uh, that we need to be careful of. And we can get so caught up in the psyche life that not only do we lose it, we miss an opportunity to experience Zoe, whatever that is. Uh, But it sounds like if we get some distance from the psyche, then maybe we can inherit or, or experience the Zoe. And I know, it sounds like I'm speaking Greek. I am. Um, So let me clarify. (laughs) We're going to round this out with a modifier. Eternal, or aeon, which is almost always accompanying uh, the word zoe, aeon zoe. Uh, So zoe has this sort of different quality about it, that it it gets a modifier most of the time when it's used. Um, I want us all, and we're going to do, we're going to practice this together. We're going to actively unlearn our assumptions uh, together. So... Eternal does not mean something that lasts forever in time. Please say this with me. Eternal does not mean something that lasts forever in time. One more time. Eternal does not mean something that lasts forever in time. You will be tempted to think this again in your life. You will hear people use the word eternal as if it refers to something lasting forever in time, including in the Christian tradition, by the way. Eternal conscious torment. (laughs) That's the terrible Christian definition of hell um, in which they're misusing the word. So aeon is a word that describes an experience independent of time. As Kate so beautifully teed up for me, aeon is unconditional. It is not in relationship to the condition of time. It is an experience that is independent of time. And so uh, if we were tempted to ask again, say we leave this room and we forget what we've just chanted together, and we say, does eternal life last forever? We might as well be asking about the average land speed of the color plaid. (laughs) This is a gross confusion of categories. To ask if eternal life lasts forever doesn't compute. Eternal life has nothing to say about time because it is unconditioned by, it's independent of time. Can't overemphasize that enough. Um, I love this Peter Rollins quote because I think it gets at the heart of of sort of what what I want to say tonight. Uh, He says, if I could put my hand on your head and make you live forever, (laughs) unending in time, but not experience the depth of life, I am not a god, I'm a devil. That's what we're talking about. It's not something that exists in relationship to time such that it goes on forever. It is a question about not quantity, but quality. Depth of life experience. So the John community speaks of eternal life in terms of it being an experience, not a concept, an experience. So we've seen, we've heard, we felt. It's something that is lived. It is not something you merely get to believe in. Uh, And because eternal life is independent of time, because it has no beginning or no end, because it is unconditional, they would speak of it in terms of the fact that it is happening now. And they also talked about eternal life as what it was that Jesus came to reveal. And so if you put it all together, eternal life is an experience happening now that Jesus came to reveal. Once again, probably radically different than anything you've ever heard communicated in a Christian church. Um, This is what the Gospel of John is communicating. This is what the letter of 1 John is talking about. These people are writing a letter. They're ecstatic because they have experienced life here and now, tasted it. So the question then is, what's the difference between the experience of of eternal life, and I realize I haven't talked about what that is yet, we'll get there, versus the psyche experience? 
Psyche or suke throughout John's writings is always spoken of as something that can be lost, something that can be given up, something that can be taken back. Um, And so, for example, we've got Jesus saying things like, there's no greater love than this than to lay down your suke, your psyche, for your friends. Again, it's something that can be given up voluntarily. um, But if it can be given up, lost, or taken back, it is, by definition, conditional. It's conditional. Your psyche, then, is the thing you get when you're born, and it's the thing that you give up when you die. You leave the realm of the psyche, you're put in the ground. It exists in space and time, and so it is, by nature, always changing always moving, always shifting, never stable. Psyche is everything that happens to you in your life. Relationships, achievements, failures, your body, healthy longings, hopes, dreams. It's always changing, moving, evolving. So if I were to ask, and you can feel free to raise your hands if you want, how many of you have a great life? I do, yeah, I have a great life, absolutely. We're all talking about psyche, (laughs) right? Marriage, the house, the cars, the relationships, we're healthy, our kids are well. Yeah, good, there's enough money. But if I were to say, how many of you, life, life is sort of pretty shit right now. It's a tough season. It's really hard to get through. Also, talking about psyche. Things are not going well. There's not enough money. Can't figure out work, that kind of thing. So psyche begins and ends. Psyche is always changing. It is unstable, and that's its nature. And so I think Jesus may be, may be understood as saying, beware of the seduction on one side or the distraction on the other of that life. Beware. Just be aware. But also that within and beneath that life, there is a thing called zoe. Zoe, a life that is experienced now that has no relationship to the ups and downs of the stock market, <laughs> to the ups and downs of your medical report, to the ups and downs of your relationships. It's an experience of the unconditional. Something that is not conditioned by all of those things that are always changing. And more than that, I I would say this is what we have to discover if we're going to possibly enjoy and appreciate and find peace in the psyche life. Because without Zoe, without an experience of the unconditional, the psyche is terrifying. Because it's always changing. There's nothing we can ever count on for any length of time. But we need to be very careful. Because this is sort of back to the video and back to what we talked about last week. We need to be careful not to break these apart, which is our tendency to want to do. Right? If we're working in a non-dual reality, we have to acknowledge that these, the psyche and the Zoe, are always operating concurrently. They're always happening at the same time. And so it's not a progression, right? You don't graduate from psyche into zoe. This is sort of the classical understanding of enlightenment, right? You're either here or you're there, right? You're sort of a fool until you're enlightened, but then once you're there, you're not here. It's very binary. You're not enlightened until you are. (laughs) You haven't had revelation until you have. That's not what we're talking about. These These are operating concurrently. Zoe is happening right now, in the midst of psyche. And in fact, there is no experience of Zoe apart from psyche because being born is the price of admission into the opportunity to experience Zoe. Only most of us tend to be asleep to that depth of life and experience. We tend only to be seeing and experiencing the psyche. And so, and, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. I know this is true of me. I think for most people, our experience of life is marked by a frantic attempt to manage conditions that are out of our control rather than to sink into an experience of that which is unconditional. I do appreciate you bearing with me. This will not make sense now. Consider the waves on the ocean. On the surface, the waves are, by their nature, always moving. They're changing, they're growing, they're crashing, they're shifting. They are both the conditions and the slave of the conditions, of the elements. So sometimes the waves are massive and deadly, entirely unmanageable. Other times, they're non-existent, and the ocean is like a mirror, serene. And when the waves are massive, when you are scrambling to survive... 
You can't see over the one in front of you before the one behind it is crashing on your head. This is when you lose your job. This is the divorce. This is when you get the diagnosis. You finally realize and admit to yourself that the friendship can't be repaired. The medication isn't working. The stress level such that you're not sleeping. There isn't enough money and your best friend is about to find out the truth. And what's going on is the way that you thought things were supposed to work out is not happening. You're barely keeping your head above water. (laughs) There's a reason we use these metaphors, right? (laughs) Like you're drowning. And then other days it's like a mirror and you go paddle boarding, (laughs) right? Because what else would you do? This is when the kids and the jobs, everything's working, the bank account, the belly, your relationships, they're all full. And here's the deal. If you don't like the raging sea, just wait. It'll change. Things will calm down. And if you really, really like to go paddleboarding when it's serene, just wait. The other shoe will drop. The wind will kick up. The conditions will get the better of you. This is the psyche life. This is life as an experience of just barely surviving these conditions, these seasons of life, whether it's survival or enjoying the relative stability of the conditions while they last. And it is always only while they last. But Jesus says there is an experience of a life that is unconditional. That it doesn't have to only be lived that way. He calls it zoe. This is the hard part. (laughs) It's counterintuitive. Because the path to Zoe um, is, is sinking, or we might say it is inward. You have to let yourself sink, and you learn that just a few feet below the chaos of the surface, the deep will hold you like a womb. And where the elements may be taking your life on the surface, just feet below. Down in the womb, it is possible to find absolute tranquility. Serenity, peace, refuge. The world's religions and mystical traditions have talked about this in many, many different ways, and I think this is what they mean. If you continue to fight the waves on the surface, and you absolutely have that choice, you will wear yourself out, and you may well drown in a battle with conditions that are beyond your control. And yes, when you're drowning, the instinct is not to go down. It's not to go deeper. It's not to sink. And yet, I think we all know, without me having to convince you, there is an unnameable wisdom in this. If you're drowning in the conditional, the only place to go is down or in, deep, underneath. I think the unconditional is that still water that is just beneath the chaos. And this experience, we have to keep in mind, this experience is in the very same water. Only our location in that water is unaffected by the conditions. I think we have to get at this experience of a life that's insulated, that's unattached to these conditions, with our outcomes surrendered, this core that is unchanged by the changing and threatening waves of the psyche life. Kate described it perfectly, that riding of the roller coaster, right? And it does sort of feel bipolar. And sort of the higher and lower it gets, the more dangerous it feels. Mike Miller was, was, I think this is a couple of years ago, uh, when we were first getting into seriously starting to practice kind of contemplatively and and practice meditation uh, in the liturgy, um, he took it upon himself to get like a guided meditation audio kind of thing. And he was describing one of his experiences. And I think you're in a library, right? Oh, at home, okay. Um, And he said that the guided meditation was essentially, or at least the the part that I remember, was him sinking. Um, He was in the water and sort of sinking and sinking and sinking. And at some point or another, realized that he was on the bottom. He was sitting on the ground, everything was totally still and peaceful, and then he realized, that's not the ground. 
That's God. <laughs> Which is not, that's not something that was told to him <laughs> in the meditation. This is something that he arrived at. And I think there is something unquestionably about this imagery, about the ocean and the water and the serenity beneath the chaos, the womb of the deep, the ground. We talk a lot about the ground of being. <laughs> And again, keep in mind, there is no distinction in the ocean between the surface and the deep. It is the same ocean. It is the same water. It is our relationship to it that changes our experience of it. Sinking just a little bit changes everything. It's not a dualistic separation. Instead, it's a non-dual invitation to embrace the whole, to sink into the depth of life and acknowledge that we've just been doing this thing on the surface. And I want to clarify this a bit more, because I know with our splitting and dualistic minds, we we do tend to want to keep doing this. And even as I've been trying to write this, it's been hard not to fall back into those categories. Up, down, surface, deep, ocean, ground. But let's be clear. Zoe life is not an escape from psyche life. And again, this is something that's been read into the Gospel of John, that's been read into the Christian tradition, that what we're primarily after is an escape. It's an experience of life that gets us out of the day-to-day. This is, uh, in modern Christianity, I call this evacuation theology, right? I will have troubles in this life, but at some day I'll be whisked away to the sweet glory in the sky by and by when I die, eternal life, right? And that's sort of what's been, been given to us, but this is not at all the understanding of Aeon Zoe, eternal life. Zoe is not an escape, it is a grounding. It is not an escape, it is a grounding. It's an experience of depth and stability. It's an experience of the unconditional right in the midst of the conditional, of everything whipping around us. It's not either or, it is a whole. It is the fullest experience of all of life rather than just the surface life that we tend to satisfy ourselves with. Zoe life is no more an escape than to say a tree escapes the storm into its roots. (laughs) Think about that. Zoe life is not an escape any more than to say a tree escapes from a storm into its roots. That's not how it works, right? The roots of the tree are always there. They are the tree. They are what grounds the tree. And they enable the tree to withstand the elements. There is no such thing as splitting the tree from its roots. They are one. But without the roots, the tree's experience of the elements is entirely different. I think Zoe is this invitation to experience a rootedness, a groundedness in the depth of a life that is more than the day-to-day and the ups and downs. And this is what I hear uh, in the Rilke poem that that was read. He says, there's a necessary falling, um, a necessary sinking into, maybe a surrendering to our inability to control the psyche life. And rather than, she's talking about gravity, rather than frantically clawing at the sky, struggling to rise above the psyche life, fighting against gravity, we can descend into it. We can fall beneath it. And I love this line. She says, if we surrendered to Earth's intelligence, we could rise up rooted like trees. And I love the way this plays with our desire to make this a dualistic thing. Like, are we headed down? Are we going up? We're rising up, but we're rooted down. It's because it's, an, it's the whole. Somehow it's an experience of going down that we have a rootedness in our experience of up, whatever those things are. So it's only when we sink in. It's only when we surrender to gravity, when we sink in, that we can experience what it means to be rooted when we give up that fight on the surface and sink beneath the psyche, when we surrender that fight to gravity, and we learn, as Rilke says, to fall. I love that. There's something so powerful about that line, to fall. Patiently to trust our heaviness. And this is where I think Zoe becomes more than just an inner thing. This is more than just my personal 
experience of stability in life. It's more than just my, my personal experience of the unconditional. I think when this becomes lived as sort of a, a value and a conviction and an experience of a community of people together, I think this can actually transform the world. Groups of people living with an awareness of this kind of depth. Simone Weil is a philosopher who plays with this theme of gravity and what she calls grace. So for Weil, she says, gravity is the name for the world of force. Gravity defies not, defines not simply the laws of physics, but the ways cause and effect operate in the very depths of our inner life. Gravity is not only the term that describes why one billiard ball moves when hit by another billiard ball, but it also describes how affliction causes affliction, how violence breeds violence, fire leads to fire, and hate to more hate. I would say gravity is not only conditional, it is the laws and relationships between the conditions. Gravity is the world of the psyche life. But in the world of gravity, there are moments, she says, of grace. And I love this, because it it names this, this duality again. She says, grace isn't another world beyond the world of gravity. But instead, it refers to an experience that occurs within the world of gravity. In the universe of quid pro quo, proportional response, and mutually assured destruction, grace opens up a space for something novel to occur. In the world of the conditional, the unconditional breaks in. Or we might say breaks through, breaks up from underneath, breaks out from within. Instead of violence leading to violence, instead of hate leading to more hate, grace subverts, grace gets underneath, gets within, creating the possibility that violence might be confronted with peace, that fire would hit water, that hate could encounter not more hate but love. While the world is one in which affliction leads to more affliction and suffering expands until it seems to swallow up everything in its path, Grace is the name for an experience and a form of life that challenges the inevitability of hate winning. But it has to begin with a groundedness in the unconditional. To cultivate a life of grace means to cultivate a sensitivity to this subversive unconditional that is always just beneath the surface of the whipsaw day-to-day roller coaster There is a spark of Zoe right here within the psyche life. In a world where we're overwhelmed by the crushing reality of gravity, we get lost in the one-dimensional life, basic concerns of just surviving every day. Grace, or Zoe, we might say, the unconditional, this offers freedom. This offers peace. And again, it's not something we can escape to. It is an experience that fundamentally changes our experience of everything else. Not here or there, but an experience of wholeness and oneness. This is interesting. Pete Rollins pointed this out. When we reject the dualistic split on the, on the one hand, we refuse to split mind, body, heaven, earth, material, immaterial. We have to be equally careful not to embrace reductionist materialism, which is this sense that the psyche life is all there is. This is equally hopeless and equally problematic. That all there is is the conditional. That all there is is gravity. And I think they offers this language that's able to avoid both and create a hopeful third direction. Like Rilke imagines in the poem, I think they would agree that it is actually in the process of falling It's in those moments where we can sink in beneath the surface, where we can let ourselves fall under and with the weight of gravity. These moments where we experience the unconditional, we touch the ground, we touch our own roots, and sense where we're grounded. This is where we taste Zoe. I think it's from those experiences, the experiences like like the author has been writing about in the letter of 1 John, from that place, then we're able to rise up rooted like trees, back to the surface, so to speak, back into the elements, back into the roller coaster of everyday life, able to stand against even the gravity of the psyche life and to practice even in the midst of that gravity, of the the psyche and the conditional, the kind of grace 
that changes things. Grace that leaves room for a different way. And grace that can offer that experience to a world, as you all have named, that is desperately in need of something different. And again, offer the world not as an idea, not as a religious doctrine, but as the overflow of our experience. That's where this letter came from. And I think that we could be this kind of letter. We could be people who are grounded in this kind of life such that it overflows into the world in a way that changes it. A life that's grounded, that's unconditional, stable and calm, grace and joy that lack nothing. Not because everything's going our way, but because we've found a groundedness in something that doesn't depend on those conditions. The writers say, we want you to know that we've experienced the kind of life that Jesus said was possible. We want to share this unconditional life that has always been. We want you to share in that life and experience the fullness of joy that it brings. Which begs a couple questions uh, as we close. I know that you know your psyche life. I know you know it. It's chaos. I probably talked with most of you personally about the roller coaster. I know you know your psyche life. Have you experienced Zoe life? That's the first question. And then whether you have or not, you may not be sure, that's fine. Whether or not you have experienced the unconditional Second question is, do you want that? (laughs) Do you want that? I know that's kind of heavy. I'm just wondering. (laughs) And if not, that's fine. You can keep coming back. You'll learn a lot about the letter of 1 John. Um, But but I do think it's fair to be clear (laughs) on the front end of the entire fall to say that my goal for the next few months is not that we better understand the letter of 1 John, (laughs) right? That we disagree or agree with it or whatever, but that my ambition is is to continue (laughs) over the next whatever, 12 weeks or 15 weeks, I don't know, just to endlessly invite us to find any means possible of experiencing that kind of life, which we'll begin to explore next week. Uh, We'll talk about the practice of that. Um, But one of the ways that we ground ourselves, one of the ways we practice this sinking in, uh, is to return every week to this table, which is a very practical form of the unconditional. It is a table of grace. It's a table which, in its openness to all people, roots us and reminds us of unconditional hospitality. This table, which rehearses the life and the death of Christ, the kind of life, though in the gravity of a system marked by breaking bodies and marked by shedding blood, the kind of life that lived the kind of grace which responded willing for his body instead to be broken, for his blood instead to be shed, to challenge the gravity, to challenge the inevitability of violence. And so we sink in each week, we fall into, we root ourselves again in unconditional grace, in this kind and in this quality of eternal life. It's actually in John's gospel that Jesus says, eat and drink and you will have life. Amen. The table has been set for us tonight. It is open to us and to all people and no one will ever be turned away. When you're ready, feel free to come up and grab a piece of bread and dip it in the cup. That's a robust loaf. The table is set. Come.